In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So in years past, we've put off seeing the Star Wars movies until the crowds have thinned down a little bit, or uh, until my sister has come from out of town at Christmas. Uh, but the problem is, is that uh, in my children's classes, uh, their classmates are so eager to talk about what happened that uh, spoilers are revealed and they're always <laughs> left a little disappointed they didn't get uh, in on the movie before the spoilers were revealed. So, uh, so yesterday evening we went to see Star Wars and as we're walking across the parking lot, uh, my, bless you, my kids asked, uh, uh, do you think in another 15 years there'll be another trilogy? And I started to think and pretty much every 15 there's been another set of movies and uh, with Disney owning it, I'm betting probably so, if there's not one every year uh, for the next 15. Uh, but I also started to think that um, I was, I'm a little older than the whole Star Wars. Uh, uh, it's not even a trilogy anymore. I don't even know what you call nine, eight of nine. Uh, but it started in, what, 1977, so 40 years ago. And I started to think about the corpus of those 40 years. The Rebel Alliance has never... Uh, been in position to win. Have you ever noticed that? That I mean, it's never had a movie where they outnumber and outresource the, uh, the 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 evil empire, uh, and and really all bets are on the uh, you know the good guys. They're usually a small band of rebels that you know are holding on for dear life, and there's only one possible chance for uh, for them to prevail. Uh, yet I have never been discouraged, uh, and they don't seem to have been discouraged. Uh, and you start to think about it. What is it? Uh, that makes, uh, one, that makes the movie so great, I think is part of that, but uh, what is it in the fabric of the movie that gives them uh, that ability to carry on? This has been three generations now, I mean, from uh, Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi's generation to, uh, uh, to Luke and Leia's gen and, and, uh, generation, and now uh, uh, the next generation, and I'm going to delicately talk about this movie without giving anything away, since my children have already complained about that, um, you know, but I also started to think about the way that it, it, it operates uh, on two different levels. Have you ever noticed that almost every one of those movies operates on two different levels? There's the, the big battle going on, which involves the vast, vast majority of military resources. And then half the movie is framed on uh, a battle between two people, you know, two, two Jedis. Uh, and it's almost like one is, is the cosmic reality of the universe, and the other is actually the, 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 the battle going on. Uh, but I think that uh, one of the prevailing messages, one of the reasons uh, uh, for hope um, is that there is this belief that there is a force in the universe that always bends towards good. Uh, and that's what usually takes place in that one-on-one -on -one battle um, uh, between the Jedis. Uh, well, this uh, you know, unlikely uh, scenario is taking place up above with uh, a small band of ships against this incredible fleet. Uh, but the other battle is probably the more important because that's the battle... Uh, that, that affirms uh, that there are powers in the universe that bend towards good and towards justice. Um, and, and, and in that, um, the movie uh, continues to, uh, to take place and, uh, and, and invoke people like me to uh, uh, jump out to go see it as soon as they come out after 40 years. And as soon as uh, the, the, the yellow writing starts to pan down the screen and the stars are in, in the background and the music plays, uh, I might as well be that, uh, that eight-year-old uh, child in the movie theater again uh, but I think that that's part of it, is that there is, um, there is that af affirmation uh, that there is a positive force that bends towards good in the universe. Um, and uh, this is as much as I'm going to give of the movie. Um, <laughs> there was a quote that I sort of felt like captured the essence of it, uh, and it's by one of the smaller characters. Uh, um, and she says uh, that we will win uh, not by fighting what is evil, uh, but by saving what we love. Uh, and I think about uh, how we find joy and how we find hope uh, and how we, we continue in the world. And uh, if I were to be honest with myself, too much of me is fixated on what I'm upset about. When I turn on the news or, uh, or, or what frustrates me in my uh, uh, local life or, or, or as, as a citizen or, uh, of the United States or a citizen of the world, I fixate too much on what I don't like and not enough on saving what I love. And I, I think that a good bit of the readings uh, today remind us of the critical importance um, of one, 
uh, believing in that positive force in the universe, uh, and two, uh, preserving and saving what we love. Uh, first, I want to talk about that reading from Isaiah. And Isaiah, uh, you know, it's written as one book, uh, but it really is multiple books, and it's written over a couple hundred years. Uh, you know, the first part of Isaiah it takes place before um, the, the Babylonian exile, and uh, uh, the uh, Israelites are being told, if you don't change your ways, uh, there will be consequences. If you don't amend your life and bend your life towards God and God's purposes, there will be consequences. And then the second, the largest part, uh, is that Babylonian exile, uh, uh, talking uh, to, to the folks after the uh, Babylonians have come in and they've taken uh, the, uh, probably what you'd call the intellectual elite, the, uh, the, the priests, back then I guess they were intellectual elites, now it's, um, you know, but, uh, uh, and the leaders, and they, and they basically took them into slavery and they, uh, uh, and, and, and they stripped them away from their land that they'd been promised. Um, and then the, the, the third is the restoration. Uh, the third is, is uh, life after they get back. And we get this incredibly positive reading. Do you notice, if you read it, uh, one, pay attention to the tense of it. It's all in present tense. Uh, so it's talking about a current uh, reality, uh, a current reality that hasn't happened yet, if that makes any sense. Uh, when you read it in the present tense, even though it hasn't happened, when they get back there, uh, they're pretty disillusioned. They're pretty disappointed. It doesn't look like their memories. I mean, imagine... Uh, uh, thinking of those most beautiful places of your childhood uh, when you go back and you see it uh, and it's not as you remember. And now imagine that after it's been abandoned or destroyed um, uh, or it just has had 30, 40 years of neglect or a century of neglect um, and you come back to it and you've been waiting your whole life. You haven't been waiting just your whole life. You've been waiting corporately generations uh, of life to get back to that promise uh, place and it's not what you remembered or it's not what you envisioned. Um, and it would be so easy to lose hope, uh, but they don't. These are some of the most affirming and joy-filled uh, words uh, in Scripture, words that come out this time of year as we get close to, uh, to Christmas, words that were of incredible comfort yesterday at the funeral uh, from that third Isaiah, uh, when really it's not upon them. But what I think they do, um, what I think a lot of people do, uh, that we struggle with, um, and I'm going to, this is a little aside confession. Uh, they say that people look at their cell phone every five minutes, uh, which made me realize that I am infinitely worse than the average. Uh, I mean, I, I really, despite being uh, glued to the Star Wars movie, I had my hand on my phone about four times, you know, re resisting pulling it out of my, my pocket. Uh, but I don't think that we understand or appreciate time the way that other cultures do or the way that uh, the biblical culture does. Uh, if we don't get what we want, Right away, if you look at a snapshot of our lives, uh, we cast pretty firm judgment. Uh, uh, whereas life is generational uh, for the people in Scripture. People in Isaiah, the promises fulfilled in the past, uh, the deliverance out of slavery, uh, the, 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 the acquisition of that promised land is as so close in the rear view mirror it could have happened yesterday. And the promise uh, that God will restore the, 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 the fortunes of Zion, uh, that the, the, the new, a new Jerusalem will reign in, are as close as tomorrow, as close as the next hour, even if they're separated by centuries. They have compressed time uh, into a way that they can speak in the present tense of something uh, that they have no idea when it's going to happen. Uh, because they have that kind of patience, they have that kind of familiarity with waiting uh, and, and with anticipating God, and they have that kind of faith uh, that the universe bends towards God, towards justice, towards what is good. Um, and I think that we miss that sometimes. I felt like there was more of that in, in Haiti, uh, despite their poverty, uh, there was a patience and a joy uh, and an anticipation of God uh, that sometimes we don't have. And then the magnificent. How do you find joy when you're a teenage peasant girl who's uh, old, much older fiancé, not an amorous fiancé, you're just much older fiancé, is uh, <coughs> contemplating whether to dismiss you uh, because you're pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, there, uh, the punishment uh, for that being uh, your parents' uh, right to stone you to death, your uh, fiancé's right to stone you to death, or just death in, in childbearing, um, and you're visiting... Uh, you're visiting your, your aunt uh, or your cousin, 
And, um, and she has this experience. Now, she's visiting Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth, within Elizabeth's womb, uh, the baby bounces up and down, uh, acknowledging that this is something incredible. Uh, and Mary lives in that pregnant moment of being able to experience joy that hasn't uh, occurred yet, uh, to believe so much in the promise of her ancestors and the generations that have gone, uh, that have gone before her, and so palpably believe in the hope that is to come, uh, that she can make this glorious song uh, despite all of the vulnerability and the anxieties and all of the stresses uh, of, of where she is in that particular moment in time. Uh, and it's not an easy thing to do. It's not something that I'm uh, particularly prepared to say that I'm very good at, uh, but it's something I yearn for, uh, to live uh, that palpable <coughs> between the promise uh, of God's work uh, in generations past and the assurance of the future. And the same uh, is true with John. Uh, John reads the words of Isaiah uh, as if they are brand new, uh, and he anticipates, uh, and he's able to get out of the way, which is another piece. I think so much of my life is about me. It's about Ben Moss and my comfort and my anxiety and my stress. Uh, and so it's difficult for me to see God generationally, uh, cosmically, I see whether I'm doing very well at the moment. And I think part of our Advent journey is to be able to get rid of that lie and to step back and to understand God in, in, in a broader sense. This is another confession piece. This has been a tough couple months. I will be honest. Pastorally, people I love, uh, people uh, that I've ministered to are in a tough spot. Uh, there's, uh, whether it's health issues, whether it's emotional issues, whether it's relational issues, it's been a difficult few months. There's some stressors within the life of the church between a, uh, you know, a, a building project that's uh, got its unexpected and expected uh, stresses and, um, and, and, and our bookkeeper's uh, health issues and, uh, and, and our concern for her and then uh, the budgeting and all the other pieces that come with it. And it just all of it sort of in the moment uh, makes joy difficult. The question is, how do you step back? How do you step back and realize that God is still in Realize that we have this season in our lives to anticipate God, to have joy, even when it's a commitment to joy and not a feeling of joy. Even when it's the assurance that the forces in the universe bend towards joy. How do we do that? It's getting a little bit less I, a little less bend, and a little bit more God. Pull a little bit of myself up so a little more light can shine in. Been at night uh, walking in the woods, and you have to put your hands over your eyes for a few seconds uh, uh, to really allow them to adjust to the darkness so that you can see the light in there. Maybe it's readjusting our eyes. So we can have the same lens that Mary, that Isaiah, that John had to anticipate God, and to be able to have profound joy, even when it doesn't resonate in the moment. 